Um, we can go ahead and get started. Um, I have the pleasure of welcoming to the stage Jan Yanboom. He's an embedded engineer and developer evangelist of IoT at ARM, and he's always looking for ways to connect more devices to the internet. Please welcome Jan. Right, thank you. So, um, this is actually my second time here at uh, Dea.am. Um, three years ago, I was here at the Stylite office, which was a lot smaller than this venue. Um, at first, I was really excited that they, that they invited me because I figured, you know, it's really cool. I can talk to all these developers again. And three years ago, I still remember the tweet for beer thing. That was awesome. It's the only time I've seen them in a conference. But then I also got a little bit worried because I realized that this conference was at the end of July two weeks after the World Championship of Football would have ended. And as a Dutch guy, going to Germany right after the World Cup is often not a very pleasant experience. But fortunately, Germany sucked really bad. <laughs> as someone told me yesterday at a speaker dinner, they said, there was a running joke right after uh, getting eliminated that said, if you're really quiet, you could hear the Dutch laughing from across the border. So. Um, yeah, my name is Jan Jungboom. I am a um, developer evangelist for ARM. Um, this is uh, me a couple of months ago at a data science conference in Africa where we were working together with the Kenyan University to bring data science and machine learning um, directly to fields that, that matter to uh, people in East Africa. So we built, um, we added sensors to tomato farms. Uh, we added sensors in wildlife to detect what kind of animals were running around the forest there. Um, I think the combination of being a developer and someone that's outgoing and actually goes to build this kind of project is really cool. It gives you the first hand insight in what people are doing with your technology, gives you interesting insights in what technology can be used for that you have no idea of. Like for me, a puma jumping over the fence of a conservatory and killing a bunch of llamas, that's not something I encounter daily. But that's one of the problems the university in Kenya actually approached us with, with the question, can we do something here? Um, and we found that in applying machine learning um, actually into the field. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Um, the project that we're going to talk about is uh, coming out of Embed Labs. It's, um, it's a research and development program that we run in ARM. If you're an engineering manager, um, I think it's a, the format that we use with Embed Labs is something you can actually replicate within your own company. So what we do is that anyone has a good idea who thinks this is where our business needs to be in two or three years, that we give them a little incubation time where they have some time to actually hack on this project themselves. If they see that it's gaining some traction either in the open source world or within the company or some customers start asking about it, that's the moment that we can incubate them into my team and help nurture them actually build their community or actually build a product and hopefully after a year we can actually shell this out. And that's something that's really cool. Some other companies call it exploratory engineering and I think that for every company that has that's grown over three, four hundred people and has problems actually finding innovation or, or finding innovation projects, that this is a really low barrier for all of your engineers to start doing something really cool and something they actually believe in. And we've seen some really cool projects come out of this and I'm gonna talk to you about one of those. Who has seen this movie? So this was before Kevin Spacey was, uh, well, caught. <laughs> um, so this is the movie 21, and it's about the MIT Blackjack team, which was making rounds in Las Vegas in the 80s and 90s. And they were using statistics to do card counting and actually beat the casinos. Now, I thought it was really cool, but when I was researching information for this talk, I found that the MIT team actually did something else with blackjack, which is a lot more significant when thinking about computer science history. In the 50s, the MIT computer lab, whatever, mathematicians, um, actually ran 4 million simulation of blackjack hands, which was the first big simulation that ran on a, on a computerized device to create this scorecard. If you've ever played blackjack or you've ever looked into this, this scorecard is still in use, and this is created 60 years ago by running computer simulation. Um, I thought it was kind of cool. Um, in this kind of machine learning and everything that we do with simulation start with games. So also in, uh, in 1952, Arthur Samuel, this guy, he had a computer and he wanted to really play checkers against this computer. 
So for seven years, he tried the traditional approach and just programming a checkers program, going over all um, the possibilities and then trying to find the best move. Until in 1959, he figured he was not going to get there with a traditional programming approach. And already in 59, he coined the term machine learning in his paper. Machine learning using the game of checkers. And after changing his approach to let the computer play a little bit more like a human and actually learn from itself, it took only three years, to 1962, that a computer beat a professional checkers player for the first time. Six years ago. Um, a little bit later, Donald Mitchie, he created this computer. Um, it's a bit weird one because it's analog. So it's a computer made out of matchboxes. We'll look at how it, how it goes, how it actually works a little bit further. But he coined the first term reinforcement learning. So this is a computer, an analog computer that is, that actually gets better the more games you play against it. Specifically made for tic-tac-toe. Um, if we're looking at machine learning after that, here, Deep Blue, in, the 50, in 79, actually beating Garry Kasparov, at that point the highest rated chess player. Um, recently, AlphaGo, just uh, in 2016, beating professional Go players. A lot of the machine learning efforts have gone into gaming, entertainment, this kind of stuff. And if we're looking at what currently is seen as maybe cutting edge in machine learning, or at least a really fun one, is this. So here we see Angela Merkel, and in a couple of seconds, Deepfake takes over and replaces her face with that of Donald Trump. <laughs> so that is weird, scary, and pretty awesome at the same time. <laughs> uh, however, like all of these efforts, including um, including Deep Blue, including AlphaGo, and also running uh, deepfake requires a lot of computing power. And that's kind of what we see when we talk about machine learning. We talk about clusters of GPUs. Just rendering that 30 second video of Angela Merkel on a proper cluster of GPUs took 10 hours. That's a lot of computing power. To beat, all, to beat Go with AlphaGo, Google actually created their own custom processor, a tensor processing unit, a TPU, put 5,000 of them into a data center and let that computer play games against itself. And that's a huge barrier. Um, first of all, because it's really expensive. Like, me personally, I do not have enough money to create custom silicon and actually make 5,000 of them. Um, it also has a bunch of privacy concerns because if you want to approach machine learning problems like this, it means that somewhere in a data center, there is your computing power and all your raw data needs to be streamed to that. And it holds a bunch of ethical aspects. Like what if this data is something that goes on into your home? Is that something that you want to stream raw directly to a cloud provider, yes or no? Um, and it requires a lot of power to send data back and forth. And for a lot of smaller devices that are battery powered, that's not really an option. Um, if you were here three years ago, I was, uh, I was talking here on stage as well. As you can see, it was a lot smaller back then. And I was talking about using mobile phones or mobile phone hardware to build connected devices. And relatively fast, and mobile devices typically are pretty battery efficient. However, the problem is if you want to run an actual connected device, some, then you're talking not about days of battery usage, you're talking about months or years. So even if we can get a machine learning model actually push it down to the size of a mobile phone, for example, with TensorFlow Lite, I'm still not really hitting the actual numbers that I want. I want to run something in a year on a battery. That's what we're actually thinking about connected devices. If I have a plant monitoring device sitting somewhere in my house and every three days I need to charge it, it goes the same fate as my Fitbit, which I wore for the first two weeks, and after that I got really tired of charging it every week. So if we're thinking about actually pushing machine learning to connected devices, what we need to target is a microcontroller. And these are ubiquitous. Like Arm alone shipped, well, our partners shipped 21 billion of these last year. These are literally everyone. There's three microcontrollers for every human shipping every year. And we're expecting to ship over 100 billion in a period of four years' time. And these can be find in, found in almost everything. If this light sculpture would be controllable from a central location, there's probably a microcontroller in there. It's a little bit of computing power, less than 100 megahertz, um, limited RAM, maybe 256K. You program these in bare metal stuff. Um, but the nice thing is that they're really cheap. Often can be found under a dollar. They're really small. Like, you can fit one on your fingertip. 
and they're really efficient. If they don't do anything, they can run for years in the battery. So within ARM, we started thinking, OK, so if these computers are so ubiquitous, and we really want to do machine learning, preferably someone as close to the actual edge as possible, because that's where the data is, and we don't want to send all that over, how can we approach that thing? So let's take a step back and actually see what machine learning is, or how it gets these capabilities. But looking at the, at the analog computer I showed a little bit before. So this, this computer is made to play tic-tac-toe. So tic-tac-toe has nine squares. You put an X or an O in. When you get three in a row, you win. Now this computer is not aware of that. So how the, how the guy designed this computer is that for every state on the board, so in this case two X's and two O's, in a certain position, he labeled a matchbox. So for every possible state of the board, and there's over 700 ones, 700 states, he puts a matchbox in there. And in that matchbox, he, puts, he color codes all the possibilities, in this case five places where he could potentially place a move. And for every position, we take two marbles and put them in that Lucifer box. So this is the initial state of this model. And you do this for every box. So this is a very labor-intensive process, because there's 700 possibilities and a lot of marbles. Now, when you, when you encounter this state while playing, and you want to make a move, you just randomly pick one marble out. You then place your move, the computer's move, at that location. And you keep that box open. Now, depending on the outcome of this game, you do this for every state after, so maximum four times during tic-tac-toe. Now, depending on the outcome of the game, whether you win, you lose, you draw, you take an action. So if we lose, we actually remove the marble, because apparently this was a losing move. If we draw, we place the same marble back. But if we win, we actually put three marbles back. And this is a reward function. So a reward function is something where we can tell the computer, are you doing something well, or are you doing something not well? So this is how we give immediate feedback. So in this case, it's a losing move, because now I can put my O here. And we, learn, we teach the computer this by removing that marble. And we do the same thing for the move that it did previously in this game, because it led to a losing game. Now, if you encounter the same state, instead of 10 potential marbles, we only have 9 left here. So once again, we pick a random marble, in this case, the dark blue one, which is a winning marble. We place it down. And we don't put just one back, we actually put three marbles back. And now you can see that the chance of picking this winning move has gone from 2 out of 10 to 4 out of 12, 13. 4 out of 13 with just playing two games, encountering this game twice. So we've gone from a completely neutral game that doesn't understand anything about tic-tac-toe, is that we thought it that if you have two X's in that position, it's a lot better to play that third X, depending on what. So we're teaching this computer a little bit how it's going to play. Now, training this model is incredibly inefficient. It takes a really long time, because I have all the 700 boxes. I need to play, I think, the calculator, you need to play about nine, 900 games to get more or less like an optimum state. And that's a lot of games and a lot of marbles putting in putting out. But if I give you the completely trained computer, and I tell you, please play a game against it, but don't rebalance, it's actually really easy. You look at the, mar you look at the box, you take it out, you put a random marble, you place, you place your move, do the same for the second one, same for the third one, same for the fourth one. And that is really efficient. And I figured that's something that we can actually exploit. So during training, we see hundreds of different states. We constantly need to rebalance, which costs a lot of computing power. The actual classification is really easy. So we figure, well, training, like for AlphaGo, for example, of 5,000 TPUs, that's not going to be feasible in these edge nodes. But classification, if we do this right, can be done very efficiently. So we've released um, a library called uh, MicroTensor which is a TensorFlow-compatible library, specifically made for microcontrollers with less than 200 kilobytes of RAM. Um, and the only thing it does is classification. So you can give it a trained model, and then you can actually run, you can ask the model to actually give you a result based on some inputs. Um, the idea is that a TensorFlow-compatible because we really care about the ecosystem. So we have some tools available to actually map this into something you can run on the microcontroller. Um, open source, Apache 2 licensed, and it has a bunch of specific optimizations actually run on our ARM cores, so we can do this a little bit faster. Um, so what does that enable? So one of the big things here is, um, I believe, that's going to come in the next years is sensor fusion. 
So thanks to mobile phones, we have access to really cheap basic sensors for anything. Um, pressure, uh, if you're holding something close to something else, uh, temperature, uh, motion sensors, accelerometers. These have all become less than a dollar or something in cost. The downside is that they're really good at measuring just a single thing. And a lot of events in our world are not possible to express but just values of a single sensor. If I'm holding my phone close to my ear, yeah, that's simple with, uh, with a distance sensor. But if there's something like, is my water running or is my uh, uh, garbage disposal on, that requires data from a lot more sensors. So the idea with sensor fusion is you don't train on data from a single sensor, you train on multiple axes of different sensors at the same time. And that you get a composed sensor which you, can then, uh, which you can then stream raw data in to actually classify events. So this is a little um, video for a particle super sensor. There's train on things in the home. So we see a uh, faucet running here. After that, it does uh, garbage disposal on. And a little bit later, here we get the blender. And I think at some point, it even puts the stove on. And it does this by combining data from 10 different sensors at the same time, training on a variety of household events, and then streaming the raw data to sensors through and actually classifying a lot of really cool events. Now, like, this is one of the things that we can now enable. No training required, just classification on that end node. Something else we can do is federated learning. It requires a little bit more processing power, but this is, for example, what Google is doing on their um, keyboards. So when an when a Android phone comes out of the factory, they have a base machine learning model on it. But you'd like to retrain that a little bit to learn your preferences, to learn the people that are in your network, um, common abbreviations that you use, actually get that in there. And preferably, you want to get the data from all the users and actually rebalance the, the main tree that you have to make the model better for everyone. Now, of course, I don't want to send my raw data back to Google. One, it's really slow. And two, there's a lot of really privacy-sensitive information there. So what I would rather do is, so what Google does is basically get a diff between the original model they have and the model you have on your phone. So the weights are rebalanced a little bit, send that diff over, and then use that to optimize the model of, everyone, of everyone's phone. I think that's really cool because it requires a lot less processing power, still a bit more than we currently can do with microtensor, but really cool stuff. Um, another thing that we do is um, autoencoders. So traditional compression algorithms are really are operating on byte level. They're looking at how can I compress a string of all A's into a way that I can separate, maybe A12, that's 12 A's in a row. So with an autoencoder, you throw enough training data to it that it starts detecting features between those images. So one of the things that has been used is uh, scaling up pixelated images, so 8-bit NES images. You feed a lot to it, it starts learning that there are certain shapes that need to be represented, and you can blow it up and get a better result than if you'd normally try to do that with an image calculation algorithm. And that's cool for anything that's a very limited uplink. If I can only send 20 bytes a second or less, what we can do with like LoRaWAN or Narrowband IoT, having the computer figure out a better compression algorithm for my specific type of data is really valuable. Um, and then anything is offline and self-sustained. Um, this was one year ago in Tanzania where I did a project with the University of Arusha where we made sensors that would go on cows and based on skin temperature and um, the movement patterns of the cow, based on an accelerometer, we tried to detect if a cow was restless um, and through that if the cow was getting sick if the cow was in heat, because sperm samples are really expensive, so you only want to inject the sperm whenever the cow is actually in heat. Um, and that's something, I mean, I can't put a whole server farm down there. These need to be systems that run completely self-contained and send a, a message to the phone of the, uh, of the owner the moment that something is going on. So for this, you want to run it on the edge. Plus, I've seen how hard it is to actually catch a cow. You think they're just standing still, but if you start running after them to put a sensor on them, they can run really fast which was kind of funny because I was running there with a Wi-Fi base station and my, and my laptop after the cow. Was, students love that. Um, so you want a self-sustained system that actually can run for a long time. Um, in my previous company, I used to work in Telenor, a big telco, a bit like Deutsche Telekom. Um, one of the first systems that we built was a way to monitor toilet usage in a non-intrusive way. So we did really, really simple stuff, just counting how often a toilet would open and how often a toilet would close. Um, 
We use that information to feed back into the facility management system, to send cleaners more often to places where toilets were being used a lot at that particular day, and not so often to toilets that were not used because maybe the team was away. But that's still required to do everything at a local place and sending raw sensor data over. If we would do this again right now, we would get data from a methane sensor or get data from all kinds of like, people counter sensors and do all this processing directly locally. Um, so we've been working on microtensor for about a year. Um, we kinda, I have three demos that we're going to show. Um, the first thing we've done is uh, handwritten digit recognition. So this is a little photo. As you can see, there's a banana for scale. So um, this is a little board that we have here. So if you want to try this out later after the talk, you can do that. So you can draw on the touch screen. You press a button, and then it will tell you what the digit is. Now what's cool here is that this runs in less than 100 kilobytes of RAM. And it's a fully trained deep neural network. And this processor is less than 200 megahertz. Um, so what, what do we see here actually? How does this work internally? So this is the MNIST data set. This is kind of the hello world of machine learning. It's, uh, it's created in the 90s, consists of 60,000 images and 10,000 um, uh, control images. So you can actually test if it's gone. So every drawing of a, of a number is set back to 28 by 28 pixels. Uh, it uses supervised learning through backpropagation. We actually have a link on how you can train it yourself. It's not that important. Um, and let's see how we can actually get this to fit on a microcontroller in that 100K of RAM. So if we're doing image classification, we have a set of raw values, our input values, our input neurons. In this case, we have 28 by 28 pixels, which gives us 784 neurons in the input layer. Every single one of those gray things is a neuron. And every uh, value in the input layer is connected to the hidden layer, the first hidden layer. That's why it's a deep neural network. And at the end, we have one output neural, okay, it's the number that we give. Um, just before, we have 10 potential outputs, because that will be trained on, 0 to 9, and then we just pick the one that maps, that maps best. Um, so if you want to keep this into memory, this is important, it's the metric multiplication table. Because the input layer and the first hidden layer are fully connected, there are 784 times 128 weights that we need to store somewhere. Typically, these are four byte values in TensorFlow. So the first aggressive trick that we do is say, well, for classification, I don't need the full four bytes of precision. If I actually scale it down to one byte, what I just need is 784 times 128 is 98 kilobytes, one byte values. Um, so another trick that we do is that we do aggressive pruning. So if we only need the input layer and the first hidden layer, because after that we load the rest of the model, we only load that into RAM. So the absolute maximum of RAM that we need for this model, in this case 98K, of RAM. So we just aggressive quantization, aggressive purging of layers, even on a relatively well-sized model as we have here because we use the raw pixel values to do classification, we can already fit that in. Um, something else that we can do now is, uh, this is a Cypher 10. It's a bit of the hello world of image recognition. So we have uh, the value of a, a webcam over there and then the classification thing actually running in 150 kilobytes of RAM. So it's pointing at it, and now it's pretty sure it's a frog. Um, at some point, it will point at the kitten, and then we'll say cat. In the middle, it actually loses some data. But with the optimization that we've done now, we can run, uh, we do object recognition 10 times a second on a 260 megahertz processor in 150K of RAM. So here we go, cat. And I think this is, this is awesome. Like all of a sudden, even on the shittiest devices, the ones that cost $3 or something in bulk, we can actually run this. So I'm, you know, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, the last one that we have is the um, ADL demo. Um, I'm going to show you a little video here because we have a little bit more time than anticipated. So this is something I built three years ago, which was also a machine learning project. Um, so the idea is that you have a sensor sitting somewhere in your pocket or in your hand. And then it starts class, and you teach it what certain patterns mean, and then you stream it through. So in this case, uh, green is for walking, uh, white is for sitting, and then red is for dancing. So this is, uh, we trained this on, on about five people in the Telenor office. It was 15 minutes of training time only. And you can already see that it starts to differentiate quite a bit between walking and dancing. It doesn't go perfectly fine, but this is really cool. 
And it's something we hacked together in two days already back then, although it required processing on a, on a real computer. So we've been scaling that down. And um, so today what I have is this little development board, the same one that we run our uh, handwritten digit recognition on. We have uh, a little accelerometer that sing over there, in this case on Neil's hands, who is working in my team as a tech lead for Microtensor. Um, and we stream the data, sequential data processing of this accelerometer constantly through our trained model. And it will tell us what's happening at that point. So we'll stream this data to the computer. Okay. So the positioning of the sensor is really important. <laughs> Right, so sitting in my hand. So the screen is on now. All right, so <laughs> hold steady. Does it work? Yeah. Uh, now we can go back up. There we go. Um, I can also do stuff like this. Um, this is something you guys didn't do much during the World Cup, but still. <laughs> and, and of course, the most important, because we're at DAO, I, am, I need to be very still to, to reset the thing. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> um, so, so you can find this you can find the source code for this on ADL demo uh, on our website. And this board is readily available for about 50 bucks, which is a lot more, but the chip on it is like four. So if you want to put it in your product, that's what you can do. So uh, a little recap of what we've shown today. I think that machine learning is an incredibly interesting field. We're really at the beginning of um, what's possible. We're still exploring what's possible. And I think that the development in the field goes both a lot faster People were expecting that we would only beat Go about 10 years into the future, else in a bit slower. Because in the 60s, a bunch of scientists said that they could actually do proper object recognition in images in a couple of months. And they're 50 years late now. So managing our expectations is a bit hard. But we see machine learning be applied in so many different fields already. Every iPhone has an AI code processor right now, for just for doing stuff like, uh, like health kits measurements. Are you walking? Are you running? How much distance have you been going? Google has been using machine learning in their, in their algorithms for their keyboards. Machine learning is already everywhere. And I think that being able to push this down to the smallest of devices, the devices that are literally everywhere, that are ubiquitous, that is going to be an absolute game changer. Because all of a sudden, we can put real intelligence at the edge. We don't have to pass our data to the data centers of the big tech companies. We can actually own our own data, but still do actually really cool um, conclusions from that. So if you want to get started with this, um, Microtensor is open source, Apache 2 licensed. If you want to contribute on it, please do. That would be really cool. Um, it's hosted on GitHub, utensor.ai. Um, this is our unofficial dev board, but it runs on a wide variety of other dev boards as well. Um, so grab that, grab a couple sensors, start hacking. And what you do with it later, I don't know, but let's make a profit with all of us. With that, I want to thank you all. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jan. So uh, who has a question? Anybody, any questions? Perfect. So what kind of beer do we need to buy for you at the after party is also a valid question, by the way. Um, uh, thank you for the demo. It's cool. Uh, one question I have is, uh, what about the training on the edge? Yeah. Um, it, it, I think so rebalancing a little bit is possible. So as long as the shape of your uh, network doesn't change, you can kind of rebalance it a little bit, but it's very compute intensive. Like typically, a rebalance operation is 20, 30 times more expensive than a single classification. Maybe even more because you need to write all of this back to disk. Um, so I think we're going to see it first 
there's like three classes of machine learning right now, like TensorFlow, which you can actually run on a GPU, TensorFlow Lite, which you can run on your mobile phone, and then MicroTensor, which you can run on the smaller devices. I think we're going to see some proper uh, rebalancing on TensorFlow Lite, not so fast on MicroTensor, um, but it might change because ARM is working on new, uh, new silicon called Project Trillium, which is new silicon core specifically for doing metric multiplication and, and other uh, mathematics that are really important for machine learning. And once we see that, we could actually start training. But that's a couple of years to the future. Perfect. Any other questions? So uh, as you mentioned, Tensor Light, uh, yep. you pick up pretty much models from online. Yep. You do some magic, and here it is. Do you guys have something similar for MicroTensor, or uh, you have to do this magic by yourself, uh, converting big numbers into whatever smaller and so smaller? No, so we have uh, the TensorFlow CLI. The TensorFlow CLI just takes a trained TensorFlow model and uh, uh, gives you two files. One is the model that we want to load into RAM, uh, ROM. Because it never changes, that's the idea. If you want to change, you can do a firmware update. And then another file that has all the weights. And you put that on external storage or internal storage, you have it. So the idea is that we tend to look compatible. However, um, you still have limits on the device. So if you have a, a really big network with a lot of connected nodes, it might be that it's not fitting. In that case, you need to reshape your model, which is a completely different um, piece of case. But, but for relatively small models, you can just take the trained TensorFlow model, run it through CLI, and then uh, run it directly into your device. Great. I think we have time for one more, if there's anybody else with a question. No? OK. Well, then, with that, I would like to say thank you very much, Jan. And, All right. Thank uh, you. Thank you.